Am I a masochist? I really can't say, but yes. Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to the first video in a series where I'll be reviewing Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s new book, The Real Anthony Fauci. It's about an 800-page book that is filled with all of the most common anti-vaccine claims from the past few decades. So in order to properly review it, I'm going to do it one chapter at a time. And this video is starting with just the introduction. At least that's the plan. I'm still reading my way through chapter one, and already it's pretty repetitive and rambly, so maybe I'll be able to lump some chapters together, but we'll see. Now, I've already made two videos on this channel about RFK Jr., and I've known about his claims and his website for many, many years. But here I'll be able to go into a lot more detail about all of the claims he makes and the cast of characters that he associates with. Because I said cast of characters that he associates with, and I've got a lot to get through, let's just jump right into it by first starting with the introduction where he first lists all of the people that he associates with. The book actually starts with a list of who's who in the anti-vaccine and science denial world, most of which have come to prominence during the COVID pandemic for spreading misinformation, and many of which I've debunked here on this channel. Although everybody on this list is a known anti-vaxxer, to my surprise, it includes some people who are downright insane. Two honorable mentions that I'll quickly point out that I have debunked on this channel before are Kelly Brogan, an anti-vaxxer and part of the Disinformation Dozen, who now promotes urine therapy, and Dr. Tom Cowan, an anti-vaxxer, virus denier, and someone who doesn't think that the heart is a pump. Yeah, he really thinks that. And RFK Jr. listed him on a list that he calls the Heroic Healers. This book is off to a great start. So as Robert says in the introduction, he wrote this book to, quote, help Americans and citizens across the globe understand the historical underpinnings of the bewildering cataclysm that began in 2020. But just in the introduction alone, he has already packed in a lot of his classic anti-vaccine claims that have been endlessly debunked. But ultimately, the main focus of this book is Anthony Fauci, who Robert really doesn't like. In order to justify his deep dislike of Anthony Fauci, Robert will continuously misrepresent both history and science. One of the first examples of this is when Robert talks about how much Anthony Fauci gets paid. He starts off by talking about how people who work at the NIH and own patents that were developed at the NIH are entitled to a certain number of royalties from that patent. These royalties are capped at a yearly $150,000. This is all true, but Anthony Fauci has only made royalties off of one patent, which is Interleukin II, which was patented as a treatment for AIDS. And according to financial records, he has received a whopping $45,072 since 1997. That's only about $1,800 a year. Not much. Now, on top of that, Robert does go on to say that Anthony Fauci is the highest paid federal employee with an annual salary of $417,608. This is true. Anthony Fauci is the highest paid federal employee. $417,000 is a lot of money to make as a salary, but let's put that number into some context. Anthony Fauci worked his way into one of the highest ranking federal scientific positions and has been in that position for the last 40 years. Sticking with the same position for that many years is going to get you a lot of raises, but if he were really in this for the money, then he would just be a CEO of a pharmaceutical company, which he definitely would have been able to do if he hadn't pursued this federal job. Anyway, the point here is it's not really a great idea to bring up Anthony Fauci's finances, especially when Robert himself and all of the people on his list are standing to gain huge amounts of monetary compensation from what they do. Let's start with Robert himself. He's already an attorney. He makes a lot of money from that. But on the side, he also does this children's health defense, this nonprofit that is a huge platform for anti-vaccine misinformation. When COVID-19 started, donations to Robert's nonprofit skyrocketed. And he himself, according to tax records, was compensated with about $225,000 of those donations. I've also mentioned before on this channel that Sherry Tenpenny, one of his heroic healers, has become a millionaire by teaching anti-vaccine classes online. Even the people on his list as insane as Tom Cowan, the guy who doesn't think that the heart is a pump, can make tens of thousands of dollars every month 
by running bogus seminars on the internet where he talks about how viruses don't exist. So again, the point is, if you're going to bring monetary compensation into the argument as to why you dislike Anthony Fauci, you have to also be willing to look in the mirror and look at how much money you and your crowd are reaping off of the misinformation that you spread. To sum up the rest of this introduction chapter in one sentence, it's basically Robert going on and on about how everything under the sun is Anthony Fauci's fault. Which is weird because almost everything that he's blaming Anthony Fauci for he did not directly do. Let me explain. Robert constantly refers to things as Anthony Fauci's lockdown, Fauci's COVID-19 policies, even Fauci's report card, which bizarrely includes COVID deaths that happened in several different countries, not just the US. Anyway, the fundamental misunderstanding here is that Anthony Fauci's political role is as an advisor. He does not draft legislation. He does not command Congress what to do. He simply offers what his scientific and medical advice would be. And then Congress and the president have to act on their own in order to turn that advice into legislative action. Or they can choose to completely ignore him, which happened a lot in 2020. The U.S. response to COVID in 2020 was pretty bad for several reasons. First, there was the obfuscation of the whole events that were happening in China early on in the pandemic. Chinese officials, of course, tried to deal with SARS-CoV-2 as quietly as possible so as to not look bad on the world stage. But as we know, they failed to contain it, but they didn't really make that apparent to the rest of the world. Meanwhile, in America, an extensive and detailed pandemic preparedness plan, which was mostly started and funded by the George W. Bush administration and then continued by the Obama administration before the Trump administration decided to discontinue funding it, uh, was essentially scrapped. So by the time SARS-CoV-2 made it to America, the forces and measures in place that were designed to contain such a pandemic and deal with it were essentially hamstrung. And then we got off to an even worse start when the CDC made a really big mistake in testing. Basically what happened there was that the WHO had their own SARS-CoV-2 tests that they were distributing to various countries around the world so that countries could start monitoring and testing for this quickly spreading virus. Now this is standard, but the CDC did opt to make its own test for SARS-CoV-2. But when it did that, it turned out the primers or the small pieces of DNA that are used to actually detect the specific sequences of SARS-CoV-2 formed what we call hairpins. This is bad news because what it means is that basically the tests didn't work. You would get a lot of false negatives. So because of this, the U.S. was weeks behind where it should have been in terms of testing, and those weeks were crucial. By the time we figured out how fast it was spreading, it was way too late to enact only the sustainable pandemic prevention measures. We had to go to more extreme options like temporary lockdowns. Ideally, a nation should not have to get to this. Ideally, measures should be in place to control the spread enough so that we don't have to go into these extreme lockdown scenarios. But there we were. But even then, the federal response to COVID was basically make it a free-for-all among the states. The federal government released guidelines on how to deal with COVID, but ultimately those decisions were up to each individual state. And many states handled the pandemic completely different from other states. So the point here is to look at all of this and say that it's all Anthony Fauci's fault and it's Fauci's lockdowns and Fauci's COVID policies is just a really, really lazy dumbing down of what happened. It's actually insulting to the reader that Robert paints the picture in this way. Not only is it completely misrepresenting the facts, but it's not helping anyone. You're not going to learn anything from what Robert has written here as to how to prevent a future pandemic. It's not helpful in the slightest. It's just that he hates Fauci and he's trying his hardest to pin everything he can on Fauci. It's really weird to read. And as Robert does all of this, he uses really extreme language that is intended to manipulate the reader into getting riled up and really in this hatred of Fauci, such as describing these events as a coup d'etat against Western democracy and describing these events as a time where democracy goes to die. It's absolutely ridiculous, and his intentions, again, are just so blatant that it's insulting to the reader. So those are what I see as the overarching messages and concepts that Robert tries to lay out 
in this introduction. So for the rest of this video, I'm just going to do a rapid fire on different points that I thought were worth addressing in this introduction. On page 30, after saying several times that lockdowns were deadly, he says that we have no way of knowing how many people died from isolation, unemployment, and blah blah blah, but then goes on to quickly attribute all of those things to the quarantine by saying that U.S. life expectancy decreased by 1.9 years during the quarantine. You know, maybe that had something to do with a new deadly virus that was spreading rapidly and killing thousands of Americans a day, resulting in a large increase in total excess deaths compared to a five-year average. But hey, what do we know? He said that we have no way of knowing. So, mystery. On page 31, he begins going on and on about how quarantines cause massive economic damage and psychological damage to children. Now, this whole psychological damage to children thing is definitely something to consider, but he totally exaggerates it here because he's not telling you the other side of the story, which is the fact that COVID itself causes massive psychological damage to children. Over 100,000 children in America have lost their primary or secondary caregivers to COVID. Additionally, about 1-5% to of hospitalizations in America, depending on the state, have been children. On top of all of that, children who suffer from COVID can be at risk of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children and long COVID symptoms. And yes, of course, some children are at risk of dying of COVID. None of those things are good for mental health. And if you're going to start making a case about the mental health of children during the pandemic, you have to include those things. If you don't, you're being dishonest, which Robert definitely is being here. Moving on, on page 33, Robert starts talking about how the rich got richer during the pandemic and small business owners were very much hurt by the lockdown restrictions. I actually don't have too much to disagree with him on here. It is gross that the billionaires made so much more money during the pandemic than everyone else. It is heartbreaking that so many small business owners really struggled or had to go out of business during the pandemic. But what I'm lacking in this book is a proper analysis of those events and what we can learn from them. Robert only says that these things happened and that we should blame Fauci. That's literally all he's saying here. And once again, it's insulting to the reader to bring up these complicated issues of how an economy is impacted by both a pandemic and a pandemic response policy and just boil it down to blaming someone that he doesn't like. I mean, if your goal in reading a book like this is to learn something and gain insight into complicated issues, then this is not the book for you. Moving on to page 34, Robert has this quick one-liner about how we huddled in orchestrated fear from a flu-like virus, totally ignoring the fact that COVID in its first year killed more Americans than the flu did in the past 10 years. Seems important to mention that, right? He doesn't. And then on page 35, we hear the classic COVID denier argument that COVID policies were only meant to last for 15 days. He doesn't mention the fact that two weeks to flatten the curve was a political slogan, not a scientific prediction. And also he ignores the fact that people like him kind of made this a self-fulfilling prophecy. They weren't listening to COVID policy direction then, and they aren't listening to COVID direction policy now. If you keep refusing the solutions, the problem will persist and you will continue to complain about the fact that there is a problem. It doesn't make much sense. And finally, again on page 35, last but not least for this video, he starts talking about some of his common anti-vaccine claims regarding children, health, and vaccines. He quickly makes the claim that none of the childhood vaccinations have been properly safety tested. This is absolute garbage that I've addressed in my previous videos that I've made about Robert. Every single vaccine must be safety tested, and every single vaccine is intensely monitored for safety and efficacy post-market. That means that while it's out in the population being administered to millions of people, safety monitoring continues. But that hasn't stopped Robert from trying to attribute anything and everything to these vaccines. Robert loves to point out the fact that starting around the 1980s, chronic disease in children in America started increasing. Once again, instead of bringing an actual analysis of this issue to the table, he just says that it's an issue and then proceeds to blame vaccines and also Fauci. Not even kidding. If Robert did an actual analysis of this issue and bothered to look into the history of this trend, then he would see that it's not that hard to explain at all. You see, despite what Robert might claim, medicine has progressed leaps and bounds in the past few decades, and children have been a huge benefactor of this. 
For example, in the second half of the 20th century, childhood mortality rates decreased dramatically. This is in part thanks to vaccination, which eliminated infectious diseases that were common among children and could be deadly. There were also improvements in treating childhood cancers, congenital heart disease, spina bifida, cystic fibrosis, and sickle cell disease. All of these diseases had early life mortality rates, but modern medicine helped these rates decline rapidly over the last half of the last century. Probably the most stunning of these figures is the fact that in the 1960s, leukemia was a quickly fatal disease for children, but nowadays it has a 95% survival rate. In my opinion, ignoring those advances right off the bat is just disingenuous, but it also misses a crucial point to what Kennedy is complaining about here. The fact that so many more children survive these situations rather than die from them means that a lot of them might go on to be more sickly later in life. For example, many decades ago, infants who were born at extremely low birth weights would often not make it but now we're able to save those lives much better than we used to. However, these children who are born at extremely low birth weights can be at higher risk for chronic disease later in life. Facts like these can help explain these trends in chronic diseases that we see in children today, but the issue is much more complicated than that. We know that children born to low-income families are more likely to develop chronic disease than high-income counterparts. This likely has to do with things like poor nutrition and the location of those low-income neighborhoods being in areas with higher pollution and environmental toxins. All of these are important issues that Robert, using his skills as an environmental lawyer, could really help with, but instead he just ignores all of that and blames vaccines. Even though vaccines were being administered widely to children decades before the 1980s where he thinks that all of this started. And yes, in this chapter, he does bring up the claim that vaccines cause autism, which is one of the most disgustingly stupid and brutally debunked anti-vaccine claims that exists today. I've talked about it on this channel before, and I'm not going to even entertain it anymore. I just wanted to make it clear that he is making disgusting, hateful, and wrong claims all throughout this introduction chapter. Well, that's going to do it for this introduction chapter of The Real Anthony Fauci by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I wish I could say that all we have to go from here is up after that terrible start, but I think if I hope for that, I'm going to be disappointed. As always, all of the links to all of the science that I talk about in this video are provided in the description below so that you can read them for yourself. As I said earlier in the video, I'll be reviewing this book chapter by chapter. I'm almost done with chapter one, and it is very long and chock full of a ton of garbage. So instead of doing my one video a week schedule, I'm just going to upload the videos for each chapter as I finish them. It might be several in one week, it might be one every two weeks. Either way, if you don't want to miss the reviews for those chapters, don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me whenever I'm debunking some more funky stuff. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.